Okay, so let's get started. Um, I'll share my screen. Hope you can see my presentation. So let's get started. Um, you see my screen? Great. So yeah, that's the uh, schedule of today. Um, as I said, there is we first introduce a bit more the robotic fabrication platform that is currently in Shanghai. Um, you already saw yesterday um, the live tour by uh, Philip Huan. And um, then we give a bit more intro to the context. We then have the expert lecture by Lu Ming in the, after the break in session two. And we will then have a skill up session similar to yesterday um, with a focus on the, on the robotic uh, platform simulation. Um, this is our team, and um, so the next slides that I'm going to show is important that this is mostly development by the University of Tronchi together with Fab Union. So, um, um, as both Jai Hu and me are in, uh, in Stuttgart at the moment, um, we need to say great thanks to the all the hardworking um, colleagues in uh, Shanghai, most importantly um, Guo, who is really putting a lot of effort into, into the development. And um, we're going to show some videos of uh, what they're up to at the current moment in Shanghai. Um, as you remember, we have the um, mobile timber fabrication platform. Um, it's a tracked based system with an ABB IRB 4600 on top. So that's an industrial robot arm, has a reach of, of about three meters, um, depending on the effector. And it's equipped for general purpose timber construction tasks. We're going to use it for a very specific uh, use case in our workshop. But uh, really the concept here of the platform is that it's um, a generic timber construction um, um, system. And obviously the special thing about it is that it is uh, on a track platform and be um, autonomously um, relocating itself on the construction site. Um, what is maybe still important to say is that um, whenever um, it should work precisely, um, the platform is then um, supported by the posts that you can see. Um, it's like four, four different uh, posts. Two of them are cantilevering out. Two of them are in the back. And whenever those are um, positioned, then the whole platform is uh, stable enough for the robot to work really um, reliably and accurately. Um, in our in our scenarios, we are mostly interested of the of the robot working on the floor area and in the ceiling area. Um, so we did some initial. Um, studies of the um, fabrication space, of the reachability of the platform. And um, we're going to show you also later how this, how this could be done. Or can be done. And yeah, so that's how the platform looks at the current moment. This is a brand new picture from, uh, from yesterday. Um, you saw, uh, or maybe you, you understood yesterday, they just uh, moved it to the fabrication hall, um, which is a, um, a old um, industrial hall. 
that uh, that we will use for this purpose to fabricate our thing inside. As you can see, there is not um, not so much necessary in the surroundings. So not not the typical carpentry, but really more of a simulation of let's say a construction site where you have somewhat of a um, uncontrolled environment. So this is the platform when it's um, driving around, so you can see that the posts are um, lifted and the whole thing fits through an elevator. And for testing, um, we currently have prepared a table in, in Shanghai where, um, where we can do some tests of the assembly fabrication. And we're going to walk a bit through again the proposed workflow. So we're going to first scan uh, the current structure. Then we will grip a beam, we apply the glue, we position the beam and we fix the beam with nails. And by repeating this workflow, we will have the possibility to um, construct um, beam networks of any, um, of any shape. And this should work both on the ceiling and on the floor. So we can have um, both scenarios of either the slab being fabricated on site on the floor and being then lifted up into place, or we can have the panels fixed on top and the robot working from beneath. Where really the robot doesn't really care if it's on top or on the bottom, right? Whereas for a, obviously for a human worker, um, working on top on the ceiling would be way more um, We're going to have a look at the different fabrication sequences. Um, there's different strategies that we can apply here. And um, what we didn't speak about yet is the a bit of an uh, introduction to the localization of the robot. So the main localization um, will happen with um, markers. Um, maybe some of you know them as April tags or just um, tags. Um, this is like a vision based localization. Um, Actually, um, most of those systems are also not only a localization system, but also a mapping system. So while you are, while you are um, localizing the robot, you're also mapping out um, new tags. And that's uh, called SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping. So this is really a powerful um, tool for, uh, for using robots on a construction site because you can really um, prepare your construction site with those tags. You don't need to pre-measure and pre-calibrate um, all of those um, tags. You can also map them while you're actually moving through the environment. So that's really powerful. Um, and also today really accessible. Um, so we're using an Intel RealSense camera on the robot to map those uh, tags. And given that we are proposing a horizontal surface that we, that we build our beams on top of, um, we, can, we can also prepare the surface with those April tags. You can, you can conceive, as a, conceive it as a, something like a semi-controlled environment, um, whereas on a construction site, um, typically you won't have those tags. Um, just by placing those tags uh, on, this, on the flat surface, you already create an environment where the robot really can um, um, localize itself and, um, and work autonomously. Um, as a second, um, 
localization method, we implemented the method of scanning the beams that were already placed. Um, this is important because we assume that the, that the fabrication tolerances are not going to be ideal. Right? So there's a lot of factors that we want to control on the construction side. Um, but, uh, but we, um, we still need to ensure that all of the beams have a sufficient overlap um, for actually bonding together with the glue interface. Um, but as it's not really important if the beam, um, the whole beam assembly is um, precise in its totality, um, it's mostly important that, that, the pe that the beams are positioned correctly relative to the other beams, right? So um, the absolute precision in this case maybe is not the most important, right? But we, we would rather want to um, uh, make sure that when we place a beam, we find the correct spot of that beam relative to the already um, constructed beams. That means by scanning the timber beams, we're basically taking a photo of the beam um, with additional um, depth information. Right? So it's a RGBD um, camera. We can then um, um, detect the, uh, the corners of the beams and then check the scanned location of the beams against the location in the 3D model. And depending on the location, we can then update um, the connection region, we can update the position of the nails, um, and we can update the position or the area that we want to glue. So this is a quick um, video of how this, uh, how this looks uh, in, in the camera. So you can see the camera is located on the effector of the robot. Um, and whenever the tags, those uh, fiducial markers, are inside of the camera, you can see the coordinate system being placed on top of the tags. With those two loca locations of the fiducial markers, you can then transform back um, to the coordinate system of the base. Um, And now here you can see how the workflow of uh, assembling a couple of those beams uh, works. Um, the first beams in this case are not glued yet. So they're just grabbed from the input stage um, and placed on the banner surface. And then the last one, we apply the glue on top, and then we place, and we nail. I think in the next days we're gonna update more on the uh, on the fabrication process and um, keep you updated of what's happening at the moment in Shanghai. Um, I think with that we can start with the um, interactive lecture number two, which is the background and context um, presentation for advanced robotic timber construction systems. Um, before that, uh, maybe we can do a quick uh, session of questions and answers, if there is any questions. Far. Timber construction no,
Okay, then let's continue. Uh, just a quick reminder that uh, if you haven't uh, uploaded your uh, homework yesterday, please remember to upload what you did in the Google Drive folder. Thanks. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good reminder. And I guess we will, we will run through the uploads. Uh, we'll have a look at the, at your um, uploads um, later today. Yes, in the last, uh, so the scanning of the beams um, is still a bit work in progress. So the last video only showed how we are, how the general workflow works, and um, we'll update on the scanning of the beams um, as soon as it's it's ready. Okay. Um, so this is a bit of a, a background introduction. It's going to focus um, quite a bit on previous work that, uh, that uh, I was involved in ICD um, at the University of Stuttgart. But really the idea is to give a bit of a general overview of um, where we think um, robotic fabrication is going to go in the future. And most importantly, how robotic timber construction um, is different from automation systems that are uh, currently employed in the industry. Um, and this, this is kind of important because actually the timber construction industry um, in comparison to the, to the broad um, construction industry um, is really far automated, right? So the, the the level of automation in timber construction is actually quite high. Um, the it's it's even even the case that you could argue that the only reason why timber construction nowadays is again um, competitive on the market is because um, certain digital fabrication techniques um, are employed. So this is really an industry that since uh, 20 years, at least in Central Europe, um, is working uh, heavily with uh, three-dimensional models, with uh, CNC technologies and um, automated production. Right? Um, but obviously there is a, a big number of limitations and a couple of things that um, we think are still very relevant to, um, to um, push further. Um, if you can remember from yesterday, we have an estimation of the modular construction market that is basically 13% of the, of the overall construction volume. And arguably, this is exactly the market where the timber construction at the current moment is really well suited to um, to compete with other systems, um, because um, this is the market where you can really dwell on prefabrication on um, um, on standardization as well. And it's not so heavily dependent on, on flexible um, fabrication systems. But then obviously, um, as we're not, doing a, um, we're not doing a startup, for us, it's way more interesting not to see where can automation technology at the current moment be applied um, in the easiest fashion. But it's more interesting to ask um, what is actually going to happen with the, the rest of the construction market. So what do we do with all the construction um, challenges that cannot, that don't um, lend themselves to standardization, 
that don't lend themselves to strict prefabrication. And this is really the sector that, um, that we think um, uh, we need to do a lot of research still um, for, for developing um, really powerful tools. Um, yeah, so we're mostly talking about um, fabrication systems where the building components are more or less independent of the transportation limitations. So this is mostly or the most easiest way to um, to um, boil it down um, conceptually that we're interested to think what happens if we instead of having transportable building modules we have transportable fabrication modules and so we, we envision a robotic fabrication system or a network a production network of flexible and transportable um, robotic fabrication um, platforms that can be flexibly um, used for various uh, um, construction tasks. And this is very much opposed to, um, to um, conceiving architecture as a product. Right? So the, the whole market where you can say this is, there is a certain um, chance to standardize and to, um, and to prefabricate in modules. It's mostly a market where there is a lot of um, players in the industry that argue that if you conceive a building not as a project but as a product, right, you can dwell on all the management tools that are currently available in the manufacturing industries. And you you can hope or you hope that you can also use a lot of the automation tech automation technology um, because you build up your own system um, and your own architecture um, um, product that you have in control completely, right? And you kind of standardize everything. Obviously, those people never will tell you that it's a standardized thing, but you can customize everything. But really, mostly what you can customize is the maybe the color of the wall, uh, maybe a bit of the location of the window, and you can choose what kind of door handle you want. Right? But in the end, if you're from the perspective of an architect, um, this is really, really a standard, uh, an effort to standardize um, the production of uh, buildings. Right? And uh, it's not necessary, not necessarily that um, I personally have something against that right or that that this is not like a clever or intelligent approach i think the fact is just that this is not really applicable to to the majority of buildings and it's this is just starting with um with a notion that construction build uh, construction projects are often so big that actually customization can become the main um, optimization of costs. Right? I mean, if you build, if you build a, a project in a in an area where there is like low risk of earthquake, and you have locally available material right next doors, then really it's it's maybe not the cheapest to use the standardized um, production facility that is two thousand kilometers away with material that comes from another um, region and with the building system that is um, um, specified for all eventual earthquake situations and all eventual um, um, structural uh, um, load cases. So um, in our research, we're mostly interested in how can we offer automation technology, robotic fabrication technology um, for a project-based um, approach to construction. 
really how can we offer um, special tools um, in a, that are um, employed for each project in a different and specific way. And obviously the big question is, okay, but if I then need to, I need to redesign my robotic system for every project, then maybe that's not anymore um, really competitive with um, other systems, right? So then the, the real question is, how can you reuse um, robotic systems um, from, one ro from one project to the other? And you reuse it, but the robotic system is actually doing um, different tasks in both of those projects, right? Um, so to summarize, um, we can say that the industry right now is using mostly fixed and specialized automation systems. They are highly advanced, they are very intelligent, but they're specific to certain building systems and they're location dependent and they need to, um, they need to adhere to um, a building component uh, transportation limit. So whatever you're going to build with such systems, um, the decisive factor often is not what the what the client wants or what the architect wants to um, express, but mostly what fits into a truck. Right? And obviously, as a as architects, I think that's definitely something that we need to that we need to question because it's fundamentally questioning the quality of our built environment. Um, so. As kind of like a opposing um, approach, uh, we can we can say that in the architectural research community that is concerning themselves with um, robotic fabrication, um, the big argument is that if we're using robotics, then we're using an a standardized robotic uh, fabrication agent that is um, generic in terms of what it does, right? So instead of having, instead of having a specialized fabrication system um, where everything is, um, <coughs> is planned out to, um, to construct a certain um, building system, and basically each part of this system is engineered and custom produced um, for this uh, fabrication line, right? Um, the big, the big potential with robotics is that we have here a generic um, tool. Right? It's basically just a robotic arm with uh, six axes um, that then can be used to do various tasks um, more or less uh, flexibly. Right? Um, Obviously, here also we have, let's say, a gradient of flexibility, and um, there is a lot of um, robotic uh, systems that are installed fixed in this in a fabrication hall. You might know the examples from ETH and from at Erne Holzbau. These are huge uh, chantry systems, right? Where you where you have um, where you have an expensive equipment that is um, installed in a specific hall. Um, so it's, it's very much location dependent. It, it does uh, purely off-site construction or prefabrication, and it still needs to adhere to the transportation limits for, for building components. But um, as it's a generic system, um, it can produce um, various building systems. And so these are these are um, <clears throat> fabrication systems that really can be used for for various tasks. I mean, the ETH is using their their chantry to to weld steel rods together, to assemble um, timber pieces, um, to three D print in concrete. So you can you get a feeling of of the flexibility of these systems. Um, still, I think that you can make a very easy argument of saying that for that this is very valid for a research institution. Right? 
where you really want to um, test out things in a certain lab. But then for building construction, that might not be so much applicable. First of all, you might want to push the building component size. Right? So you want might want to go beyond the transportation limits. So you might want to go, you want to bring your fabrication setup closer to the construction site. And at the same time, um, you also want to, for a timber, a timber manufacturing company wants to use their hauls very, uh, very independently. And so if you, if you consider that um, you use this Gentry robot for one project right, um, that's running for six months, um, and then there's two, two months in between where the, where the Gentry can't be used because the company doesn't have a, a, a fitting project, right? then this is a huge problem for, for um, carpentries. Um, because um, their manufacturing halls are actually costing them every hour quite a lot of money. Um, and if you if you think that maybe at the same moment where the where the gentry robot needs to stand still in a certain location um, in the world. Maybe maybe a couple of thousands kilometers away, there would be the perfect project um, where this machine could be used. Right. So um, thinking about that, um, what we do in Stuttgart and also in Tonshi is we really think about how can these robotic platforms or these robotic systems be organized in platforms. Right. Um, that's somehow in ambiguous terms, right? Because it's it, we, with, with the platform, we both mean the physical platform, right? That is used to transport the robots um, in, in a very efficient manner. But at the same time, obviously, with a platform, we also mean um, the systematic reuse of technology um, uh, across um, several projects. Um, and with that, we 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 are, we are still building system independent, but we are also location independent, right? So the robotic uh, platform that's called Tim that we developed at uh, ICD, um, we used it until now mostly um, in offsite prefabrication, but really there is no there is nothing that stops it from working on site, right? So. Um, you can easily produce building components that are <clears throat> that go beyond the scale of what you can transport. Um, and um, and in Tonshi, we have a similar system that, additional uh, additionally to being location independent, it's also mobile and autonomously um, repositioning itself. So this is a system that can really be used not only for on-site um, fabrication, but also for in-situ fabrication, right? So building building your structure really at the place where it's supposed to um, stay. Right? So if you're building a wall directly in the building, then um, that's called in-situ fabrication. And I guess both systems um, comply with this kind of a flexible platform approach, right? Where maybe one system has the <clears throat> has the focus laid more on the heavy duty fabrication and the high accuracy, and the platform that we're using in Tonshi is mostly used for for um, the agility and the versatility, right? And so. Um, if we if we sum this up, we can look back um, and we can see that arguably in the in the time from 1990 to 2010, there was somewhat of a disintegrated system development between the building systems and the automation systems. Right. 
where where really um, whatever architects were doing did not really um, seek the conversation with uh, what the industry and the automation experts were doing. And um, it actually, arguably in timber construction, it somehow still worked out um, fine, right? So timber construction companies um, somehow um, saw the opportunity of CNC uh, machines. CNC machines were um, developed for, for really um, a large scale um, cutting of timber beams and plates. Right? And somehow a couple of years later, this, got, this was um, understood in the architectural community, right? But then it, it took again a couple of years until um, further improvements were made in the machine, uh, in the machinic setup, right? So you can say, if, if you look at this from the perspective of the traditional master builder, um, or the architect that is kind of um, um, communicating between the, the client, the vision, and the, and the fabrication tools, right? Then you you need to be, I guess, I guess you can easily say that um, that this time was very disintegrated, right? Where maybe maybe even the automation technology was driving quite a lot of how specific timber construction systems were looking like, and the architect maybe at that moment was more mostly uh, uh, sitting in the back seat, right? Um, now, what, um, what started with the second wave of uh, automation uh, systems in architectural research that started um, in 2010, let's say, maybe a bit earlier already, um, we, we, can, we can summarize that the architects really got interested in integrate like developing building systems and developing um, fabrication systems that are integrated with each other right so um, the big question was okay what is the intrinsic quality of um, of novel digital technologies right and how can they be used to um, set off um, of a new development in the architectural um, discourse and um, I think we can call this a discrete integration lock-in and while while this is very much integrated right the architect um, really sets up a interdisciplinary conversation with experts from various fields and together you try to develop um, new systems or a new system um, that integrates aspects of fabrication, that integrates aspects of um, structural capacities, um, of uh, architectural qualities, and so forth, right? Um, so this is really a huge step forward from this kind of integ uh, disintegrated system development, right? But still, um, arguably, whenever you finished the integration or whenever you finished um, the, the development of one system, you ended up in the lock-in effect, right? Where your system was so well integrated with each other that it's really hard to then change either the architectural building system or to change the tools with, with which it is um, constructed, right? So whereas this is really um, an advancement, it still might not be suitable for um, the industrial application um, in, let's say, a more socio-cultural context of architecture. Um, and what we are looking forward to, I think, research on in the future, um, at least at ICD, is really um, uh, a framework that allows the integrative co-evolution 
co-evolution of both building system um, developments and the automation system development. So how can you build machines that um, can evolve over time, that can adapt to different uh, environments, to different locations, um, and can be reused uh, across various um, tasks? And how can you um, how can you um, plan architectural artifacts that uh, use those um, automation systems um, while you constantly advance the, the building systems? Um, so this is really a grand challenge, um, I think, for the whole architectural research discourse um, for um, uh, actually all the all the research that goes into into robotic uh, fabrication technologies um, but I think um, if we address this kind of approach in a in a um, concentrated and um, and um, effective manner um, and we solve this grand challenge, then this is this is the the point where robotic fabrication can really be broadly applied in, in the industry um, without compromising the architectural quality of the building. Um, so that was a bit of an introduction, and now we can look at. Um, I'll I'll go through two projects um, that we did in ICD. And um, we can later discuss, or I mean, the main point is that those two projects maybe are good to, exempl uh, good to exemplify a certain step forward in the building system development, and at the same time, a step forward in the automation systems development, right? Um, I'm not sure if we can call this already an integration, an integrative co-evolution, because the automation systems were both um, kind of um, um, planned um, on a, let's say, more on a project basis, and the automation system for, for the first project was not used um, or reused in the second project. But you will see that actually there is a certain potential of of having the systems um, look very similar, right? And reusing the technology for further um, projects. Mm. Okay, so the project that we're going to talk about is the Buga Wood Pavilion. Um, you might have heard al already about it. It's a segmented timber shell that uh, we we opened in April 2019, so just about a year ago. And what this is, it is a shell structure um, with shell structures having uh, quite a large, uh, quite an impressive history. With obviously known names like Felix Candela, that um, who was really building these like very thin um, concrete shells that um, used a minimal amount of material, and the reason why we don't see these shells everywhere today, even though they are so much advanced in terms of their material efficiency. Is because the labor to actually produce those shells was um, quite ex extensive. Right? So, uh, arguably, with the industrialization, um, um, and the modern modern era of of architectural production, um, the cradle was really uses as little manual work as possible and if if necessary just use a bit more material right? um, um, whereas in 
in the <coughs> sorry in the biological systems that we can find in nature um, this kind of approach is exactly the opposite right? for, a, for an organism the production of material is way more energy intensive than the distribution of the information and uh, the distribution of the information of how to arrange the material spatially, right? So in most of the evolutionarily optimized structures in nature, we can find that the structural systems <clears throat> of how, of how, for example, the plate skeleton of the sea urchin um, is conceived is really <clears throat> is really very efficient in terms of the structural capacity and the material usage um, for, for reaching a certain <clears throat> strength. I need to drink. A <clears throat> so, if we want to um, bring those segmented plate shells into architecture, it's like a bit of a geometric challenge, but it also allows us to work with uh, planar sheets of material um, to construct doubly curved um, shell structures. And really, this doubly, double um, curvature, be it synclastic or anticlastic, um, anticlastic, I guess in English. Um, allows the structures to really dwell on the membrane forces in the structure, so to kind of circumvent um, bending moments in the shell. And this um, ends up in a very efficient structural system. Um, and also is interesting, as you can kind of see the pattern of the segmentation being represented in the form, or kind of representing the um, <clears throat> geometry of the shell. Um, to plan those. Uh, to plan those um, segmented shells, we're employing mostly agent-based uh, computational um, systems, where really um, each plate is represented by a more or less autonomous agent, and therefore each plate tries to find. Um, their own spot um, within the shell that is kind of um, negotiating between structural capacity, fabrication parameters, and um, and the architectural expression of the shell. And for producing um, the first project that we did in as a segmented uh, shell structure. Um, which was the Landesgartenschau um, Exhibition Hall, um, opened in 2014. Um, a robotic cell was used that um, employed just one cooker robot with a spindle, and in the end was a <coughs> was a flexible um, six-axis milling machine. Right? Um, and with that. Um, it was really possible to um, produce a expressive space that only used a minimal amount of um, wood material to span around 10 meter. If you see here, <coughs> really the shell structure or the structural wood elements right, are very, very thin in terms of the, the um, constructive layers. So I guess in industry you could find a lot of um, projects that have a similar shape, right? That employ a similar architectural expression. But then if you look um, below the skin, really what you see is a, is, um, a space frame of uh, massive dimensions. And, um, and the performative aspect of this kind of um, Double curved geometries is really not um, used um, in terms of the structural capacity of the, 
of the structure. Um, now, um, for going forward with the Buga Wood Pavilion, um, the question was how can we um, advance this building system um, to reach even higher um, um, performance? We did this with a big team from the ICD, from the ITK at the University of Stuttgart, um, and most importantly, from the start of the project, um, we were collaborating with the construction company that's Müller Blaustein Bauwerke in um, Blaustein. Uh, we were collaborating with the client. And we were collaborating with a robotics integration company that's called BEC. Um, that is located close to Stuttgart in Reutlingen. Um, the brief was to construct a summer pavilion um, at the Fe uh, Federal Horticultural Show. This might be something uncanny for most of you. But it's really um, a very big cultural event in uh, in Germany, and was used historically to um, advance um, advance the um, development of specific cities um, 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 each t each year or each occasion that the that the Bundesgarten shall happen. If you if you are into um, by Otto, um, and um, these kind of projects, and you might remember that most of his uh, most um, exciting projects were also built at the Bundesgartenschau because it kind of allows for testing out novel concepts in a, in a bigger on a bigger stage. Um, so the question was for the Buga Pavilion. Um, how can we actually offer a big event space um, with with a kind of explosion in terms of the dimensions of the system? So we see here on the left the Landesgartenschau Pavilion and the Bundesgartenschau Pavilion on the right. And the span is increasing threefold. We have four times the floor area. And the question was, how can we use the same amount um, of, a, of material per square meter? Something went wrong here, uh, but I guess we can read well. So the Landesgartenschau Pavilion used 38 kilograms of wood per square meter. And for the Bundesgartenschau, the goal was to use kind of the same amount of wood per square meter of shell surface. right? Um, while keeping the span, or while while um, tripling uh, tripling the span. So with the span, we reach around thirty meters. And the way we <coughs> try to address this is by basically saying instead of having a segmented plate um, structure, we want to have a, a segmented shell where each segment is built out of a hollow cassette to increase the structural height. So we took the plate, we split it in half, and we um, introduced a ring beam on the edges. Right? So we end up with a top plate, with a bottom plate, a structural height of around 160 millimeters. Um, but really the material amount is almost the same as with the with the um, solid plate, and at the same time, by uh, by increasing the structural height, we increase the structural capacity of the whole system, and we have a, a hollow um, interior of each of the cassette that is then integrating not only. Um, the access to the connections between the cassettes, but can also integrate lights, can also integrate uh, acoustic uh, contraptions, um, 
So this is really a multifaceted uh, building system. And the way that we construct those cassettes is that we have the bottom plate, <coughs> we have the beam um, segments that go on each of the edges, right? and we have a top plate. And all these components are glued together with PUR glue. And then on top, we just have an EPDM waterproofing membrane, and we have um, counter bat or actually battens, and then the facade panels in a large grip line. Um, and as you might imagine, um, the constructive complexity is increased by quite a bit. Here, right? So although we have three times the performance, we need to address also um, the decision to introduce eight times the complexity of the building structure. And I guess if you if you would um, <coughs> propose that in any um, um, let's say industrial context, right? In 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 the in the practice. You're an architect and you say like okay i want to um, increase the complexity eightfold right um at the, the you, you're gonna basically stop the conversation at the, at the moment right but really i think um this might change in the future because um i guess the manual uh i guess the the material costs are gonna rise um, quite drastically within the whole conversation about the global climate um, and the global waste production. And at the same time, the ability of an architect to plan complex structures is, um, is, uh, is advancing every year with uh, novel digital tools. And at the same time, digital fabrication technologies really also allow us to address um, the complexity of this um, of this more performative building systems. Um, for that project, we additionally also had only one year from getting the contract for the project to the opening. Um, we had a huge team. Um, but we still needed to make sure that within that year, all developments are integrated um, <clears throat> in a way that really, instead of having a design chain or a kind of like a normal production chain, we merge most of the planning together. So while we're doing still design decision, you're already doing the execution planning, right? This is what we call co-design, um, and th this really um, stems from the idea of um, also integrating the conceptual and the, the integrating the development of the fabrication technologies um, with the architectural systems from start from the start on, right? and with um, with uh, the current uh, digital technologies that allow us to build up um, very accessible computational models that can evolve over time so that can be um, more and more specified while the progress is going on. Um, we can really do that. And also we somehow believe that, um, that the problem with the Tower of Babel that basically each discipline has their own language that they speak um, might be also addressed with uh, with this kind of computational approach because the language of 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 code is a very is maybe there is different languages right but the way that is that it, it that it is kind of defined and described is very um, strict and formalized so there is really no ambiguity um, if you're if you're starting to code together, um, and this is really a great um, opportunity to bring 
um, a lot of um, um, a lot of different disciplines and a lot of uh, partners um, um, together into one team. We did the, the, the colleagues from Attica did a um, structural analysis of the shell. We used the agent-based uh, national system for negotiating the, the um, forms of all the cassettes. Um, and then the question was really how do we fabricate that? Right? So how can we integrate the, <clears throat> the complexity and avoid um, years of production of manual production and um, exploding fabrication costs. Um, so we had around 400 cassettes and 2,000 beams and 17,000 finger joints and 5,000 uh, um, custom-made connectors. And for addressing this kind of complexity, um, we introduced TIM which is a container-based uh, platform, really a 20-foot um, platform container that we mounted two robots on top. And those two robots are equipped with uh, generic um, timber construction tools that really can... Um, that really can... Um, um, address a very comprehensive set of um, conventional timber fabrication tasks. So this goes from gripping beams to gripping blades, um, to applying glue, to nailing um, pieces together, to machining, and to, to um, handling the finished cassettes. And um, Compliant with uh, what we were talking before, this kind of um, flexible use of robotic systems. This robotic platform is really um, <clears throat> kind of easily um, transported. So you have you have your robots with all all um, peripheral equipment that you need. You bring it to a carpentry of your choice. Right, and then you basically just unload everything, connect all the um, all the cables, and then you're good to go. And in this way, you can really um, address various situations in the carpentry. Right, so this can work in a small room, in a big hall, in a tight space, in the angular space. Um, you can always um, kind of set up your your platform in the way that you need it for this specific project. In our in our case, we had <clears throat> the two two robots in the middle with the central turntable, which is kind of the machining uh, station. We had the material input carts, so the workers of the carpentry. Um, basically took the beams and the plates from the CNC machine, um, placed them in these input cards, and then basically rolled those in. And the robots were processing the cassettes and placing them in the cassette, uh, in the press, in the glue press. And then the press was uh, brought outside for the glue. Um, So this is kind of a fabrication simulation that um, today really, um, I think, is very accessible um, to also non-specialists. So it's possible for architects to come up with their own robotic fabrication processes, to simulate them, to test them out, and um, to integrate the fabrication parameters into the planning of the building from a very early stage on. Um, yeah, so these are some photos of the actual um, platform. This is how it was set up in the in the constructors hall. 
if you can see it in action. You have two um, effectors. Both of them are designed in a way that you can re easily reconfigure them. Right? So you can just take away the, the pneumatic grippers. You can reposition the vacuum grippers. And also for the multi-tool effector head with the spindle, with the nail gun and with the glue gun here, um, you can easily um, change the way that these tools are arranged um, based on your <clears throat> based on the needs of, of the specific project. And then really what you can do is to have your digital simulation um, very much match the, um, match the physical production. Right? That means you can reliably simulate the robotic production and you can control your robots from within the computational model. Now these are some, some short videos of the production. We were placing first a plate, but then applying the glue on top of this plate. We're then gripping the beams. And placing them on the prepared uh, surface with the glue. Then we nailed them, used the uh, timber nails, beach nails for that. And similar to what we're doing in this workshop, the nails are really only there to hold the piece in place until the glue is um, hardened out. So it's just a temporary fixation. Um, after placing all the beams, we then place the top lid. And we fix the top lid again with the nails. And now this is the the whole sequence of production of one cassette. With 10 times the speed of the real production. So the production of one cassette took around uh, four to six minutes, um, which was quite important. So we had, with the glue, we had the time pressure of actually finishing each stack of four cassettes in a given time. Right? So we really couldn't allow ourselves to um, play around and debug um, while we are producing. Um, then after the, after the assembly of the cassettes, then we're um, um, pressing the cassettes, and after pressing, we were um, formatting the edges of each of the cassettes um, on the same setup, right? And we were milling um, <clears throat> for most of the cassettes around uh, 30 to 50 minutes each. And here in this project, the quality of the production was really one of the main um, um, focus points. Um, because the building was um, supposed to be visited by um, around 2 million people. In the end, it was actually 2.3 million people um, that were um, going to the, to the Buga and were um, listening to concerts and to talks and to all sorts of events in the Buga shell. So even though it's an experimental building, it needed obviously to com comply with all the building code regulations, right? So um, the gluing already was a very um, intricate issue. Um, 
and also the production quality um, of the milling needed to be highly precise. Um, so we had the colleagues from the um, Geodesy Institute measure um, the cassettes and they concluded that the precision is around 0.3 millimeters. Um, that was important because if we wouldn't have prefabricated each cassette correctly, then this kind of joint where really there is no tolerance um, um, included in the in the planning would be impossible to assemble on set. But if the <clears throat> if the prefabrication works, you have your tolerances in control. You can basically put the shell together um, as if it was a three-dimensional puzzle. Um, and you can do that without any additional scaffolding or without uh, false work, right? Um, so this was done really only with singular um, singular supports at very specific level. So each cassette really can then slide into place very easily. And can be then um, fixed with bolts um, by two carpenters. Yeah, so this was the project. Um, I think we were really happy to to see um, having robotic fabrication take the next step towards. Um, somehow a semi-industrial um, production approach where really this is not not quite the experiment anymore and we were really happy with the outcome and um, how the people uh, the visitors of the Buga were actually using the, the pavilion during all kinds of different events Yeah, so I think with that, um, we can now go to questions. And in 10 minutes, we can, we can have a break and then continue at 11. There is a amount of questions here. All right. OK. Um, okay, Mahmoud was asking, what do you think would be the biggest selling point for mainstream architects and clients to use on-site robotics? Or do you think it would be kind of exclusive for a high-profile project? So that's a very good question. Um, I think that's really, um, that's really the conversation that we as architects also need to include in, in our research. Um, beyond the notion of exploring new tectonic systems and exploring new architectural um, expressions. I think we also really need to understand how different technologies um, come with a certain kind of responsibility and how um, robots are used in the, or how robots can be used in the industry. Um, the case for on-site robotics is a very specific one where I think I think the general um, direction of construction will go into prefabricating as much as you can off-site, right? trying to bring as much of the production into, into the controlled environment. But then as, as we discussed, I think the breaking free from transportation limitations really also um, <clears throat> um, is dependent on effective ways of um, joining pieces together um, on site. And um, this is, I think, your question itself, it's a bit hard to answer at the current moment, right? because we still need to develop the specific 
um, applications and the specific systems that actually um, are so far developed in its in their conceptual stage or in their um, in in their um, systematizations that they are really discussable, right? Um, but Maybe this is exactly what we're going to do in this workshop, right? We propose a building system that would offer certain advantages over prefabrication um, by um, being able to construct um, kind of monolithic uh, timber slabs uh, with multiple directions. And at the same time, um, 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 use use um, automation technologies to do so. Um, good, next question. Did you do the topology optimization process for the height of the beams and the stiffeners? And if yes, with which software? Um, so for the Booger project, we didn't do topology optimization. This was mostly um, uh, still very advanced um, structural simulation. That was tightly interconnected or and integrated with the computational model as explained right? but in the end it's more like a classical fem simulation where you um, simulate the current state right and you decide whether it's uh, sufficient or not. then the question from Eshin lu as we all know, the LCD Attiki have done several different pavilions inspired by the structure of sea urchin in the past few years. Some looking at the plate geometry, some focus on the joints. Um, from the aspect of bio-inspired uh, structural design, I'm curious about the process and principle of design considerations here. For example, as the mechanical property of sea urchins is actually achieved by its multi-hierarchical structure, um, from which scale of the geometric composition are you looking at during the design of each pavilion? And how did your team make those choices to make these distinctive research directions for each of them? Um, so wow, that's a very specific question. <laughs> and. Again, I think it's very well informed. Um, I think I'm, I'm really happy about the, the level of this conversation because um, this is really the maybe the crucial aspect of uh, bio-inspired design right? or biomimicry that um, you can do it very um, very much in two ways, right? Either you take everything literal um, and scale it up, and then you assume that it's it's still gonna work. But as you might know, um, <clears throat> there is a certain number of problems involved with that, right? So you really can't take a certain certain um, um, geometric system and just scale it up um, by several orders of magnitude and then assume that it's going to work. Also, obviously, a uh, a natural organism is a very different uh, uh, structure that comes with very different challenges um, as compared to architectural um, artifacts. Right? Um, so this is really the core of the research in, in biomimetic design, to understand what is actually the principle that the um, biological role model is using. Right? So what is the principle? How does it work in the biological organism? And how could we transfer it into a different scale, into a different concept, con context? And why do we assume that it's um, still valid there? Right, so I think this is, is really, um, really the big question. And other than being very careful about such transfers, I. I think there's no real um, blueprint of how to do it. I think the main notion is still that these organisms sometimes come up with very creative or came up with very creative ways of how um, structural systems can work. 
whereas in in the in the field of architecture you often tend to um, be taught a certain set of uh, a certain canon of structural systems that we understand well and that we know how to work with right and then everything that kind of breaks loose from that canon is, is somehow immediately questioned right? and um, i think in this kind of context it's really interesting to look into 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 biology and to kind of get inspired from there but then um, exactly as you say the transfer from biology to architecture is a very um critical one right and it's not not really easy and in the end sometimes it's also you can easily make the argument that okay the blade structure of the booger shell is in the end also very different from the blade structure of the sea urchin right but i think that's exactly the point that there are certain principles that got transferred right and others other um, parameters got completely changed because the context also changed. Okay, let's go on. If possible, could you explain more about the process of negotiating the geometric form? Um, now I'm a bit lost in terms of what kind of context this question was coming in. Was this in terms of the A question concerning the design of the Puga shell. Well, I'll just assume it for the for the Puga shell. Um, in that case, it's really um, it was really. Um, a very integrated um, like the conversation between the architectural designers and the structural engineers and design. And so um, actually the base the base design of this of the shell is somehow really something that we modeled in Rhino. Um, but obviously it integrates a lot of different um, um, parameters and um, computational design principles and for this kind of study of um, different um, geometric alterations we set up a parametric model and then change basically the wings right we changed the spines we made them more straight more s formed and we were specifically investigating specific parameters of of the shell structure. Um, from Ben, is the material efficiency of complex timber architecture a function of the orthogonal on bounding geometry of the component members, or do the offcuts go to secondary use? Example being burned or as biofuel. Um, very good question. So in the in the Landesgartenschau pavilion, in this pavilion, um, let me see, yeah, this, this floor here is made of, from the offcuts of the plates, right? So the offcut goes directly into the floor. Um, so most of it was reused. For the Buga pavilion, we really um, couldn't have a timber floor, right? So um, that was not an option. Um, so for the Buga, most of the plates either got reused by the carpenter for different things, kind of scaffolding and whatever. And um, the small pieces were just um, 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 first, um, how to say, they're basically broken down in very small pieces right, with a specific machine that every carpentry has. Um, and then they're pressed into pellets and then you can basically burn them um, 
for um, for generating heat. It's kind of like a one of the sustainable heating um, mechanisms that we that are employed mostly in Central Europe. So all the sawdust and all the the waste of a timber carpentry is basically stored in a big container, um, and then <clears throat> some of some of those companies actually have a small um, kind of energy um, plant right next to it, right, where they just burn all the all the wooden of cuts. <clears throat> Which sensors and localization systems are used in the team platform? <clears throat> um, we use the Leutze camera for um, ba -ba -ba, I can see. Yeah, no, it's not in the picture. Okay. Uh, we had a small camera here that is from Leutze, the smart camera called Elsis. Which is able to read like tags and do like edge detections, and um, we tested if we can actually uh, measure we can measure the glue glue application and see if that's sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, After the glue application, we were testing to see if we can take a picture of these kind of uh, glue beads and then automatically calculate if the if the um, if the bonding is sufficient. Um, this is something that um, we didn't have in the end the time to make this really foolproof. So by the building authorities, we were still um, asked to visually check um, with our own eyes um, if, if the bond is or the application was um, successful. What are the stepper motors on the base of the modules for how they work? If there are, if they are for rotating the base because the timber plate just sits directly on it. Um, <clears throat> I guess you refer to the to the turntable, right? I guess you refer to these motors. So these are these are not stepper motors. These are actually I don't know what what kind of motors these are, but they are high performance um, motors for the two axes of this um, external turntable. So this is basically a, an extension of the robotic system, right? So this is um, fully integrated with the robot, and we needed to use, we needed to rotate the panel, uh, we needed to rotate the cassette so that we can reach, we can reach it with the with the milling tool and with the nail gun and with the glue gun on all sides, right, from top and from bottom. What uh, was the positioning tolerance in fabrication process? So I guess you refer to the assembly of the cassettes. And for the assembly, we had uh, positioning errors around plus minus five millimeters. Has the glue any disadvantages in regard to sustainability, material reuse, environmental aspects? Um, yes, definitely. Um, but it but it is uh, so that this is a real, really hot topic in timber construction, where there is companies that have arguably this kind of religious view of not using any glue in timber. Um, I think our approach is that the bigger, um, the more relevant um, approach. In, in a global context is to build as much as possible with timber while using as little timber as possible. And so you want to have very material efficient um, and performative building systems. 
and you want them to be really competitive with uh, concrete and steel construction. And um, <clears throat> in this kind of uh, context, I, I really think that the that the gluing of timber is a, a great advantage. Right? Um, but per se, only the glue is a chemical product mostly produced from from oil, um, from crude oil. And um, there is very toxic glues. Um, at the same moment, there is um, very, very advanced glues that actually are disposable um, the same way as you would dispose um, um, timber. Right? So, um, <clears throat> for example, the glue that we used in those cassettes can be just easily burned within those uh, power plants. Um, it's the same glue that is in any CLT, right? And by using a very precise um, production um, system, the amount of glue is also minimal in the overall structure. So this was a question from Franz, and now we go to a question from Chris. How was moisture content of panels taken care of during construction? in relation to dimensional stability? Um, yes, good question. Um, so, okay, I thought here we see. Um, so the assembly on site um, in timber construction cannot happen when it rains. It's really, really hard to assemble a timber building when it rains right, because um, then the timber gets wet, and if it's not protected properly from everywhere, from all the sides, then you get dimensional swelling of the timber pieces, and that basically um, can destroy your whole thing. Uh, actually, in the assembly of this building, we had the problem that during the construction assembly, there was like, I think, two or three big storms. And one of them blew away the protective, uh, the, the kind of temporary um, water protection. And we had a bit of water coming into the spines. And that caused that there is now a small gap in the spines because the cassettes were pressing outwards. And um, we had all the engineers check if it's, uh, if it's a problem or not. But um, um, so it's not the structural problem. But um, but it potentially could have been. Right? So if if um, we would have had more water, then this would have probably been more. Which software processes are used for the structural analysis, and how much of a back and forth dialogue of this related to the design? Um, the software was um, sophistic, but you can you can ask this question to Simon on Thursday because he knows way more about it. Yushan um, says, um, "I'm kind of curious how you evaluate using honeycomb material to strengthen the slabs, it's also known as lightweight and easy process." Um, I don't really know what you mean with honeycomb. I guess you mean this kind of lightweight uh, material, like sandwich plates. I guess we did, like, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how to evaluate those. So Cisha, how is the texture or to say the materiality of the wood itself taken into consideration in these projects? Like the direction and the certain pattern which will influence the performance. If so, how do robots respond to these conditions? Wow, I think the really the level of questions is really high. Um, <clears throat> and now here you can see. Um, anyways. So the direction of the fibers in each of the cassettes is optimized 
for the structural capacity of the whole structure. Right? So all the fibers are in parallel to the, the curve, right? And in the apex uh, set, the curve basically always follows the kind of follows the, the falling line. Well, so it always kind of points down. You can see that also in the facade. Uh, first of all, you can see it here. But really, if you see the grain here, right, this cassette, the grain direction is continued in this cassette. Right? And here also, like all the grain is kind of continuously going in the, in the, in the same direction. Um, and also in the facade, you can see the grain um, going always downwards, right? Where for the facade, this is mostly not a, a structural problem, but more that the rain doesn't get trapped in the in the fine grain of the shell. Okay, last question from the participants. Yes, exactly as you mentioned the table, but I didn't mean at the basis. I saw some steer motors exactly under the timber plate. Ah. Okay, I know I know what you mean. Uh, you mean these, right? Yeah, okay. Um so these are um these are vacuum clamps. So you have a vacuum pump um, on the platform. The vacuum is sucked through the hose here. And then these clamps are controlled um, from both the bottom and the top. So after you place the after you place the plate, you suck the plate onto this uh, turntable. Right? So now the plate is really fixed in place. And in the next video, actually, you can sort of see also how this is. Okay. My computer is freezing. Not a problem for the. The thing. Any. Anyway, so the plate is sucked onto the onto the thing. Okay. Um. I guess we can have a quick break. Should we continue at eleven sharp, or as we did a bit of overtime, should we take a full half an hour, and. Continue at eleven fifteen. Wow, what do you think? Uh, maybe half an hour. Half an hour. Okay. Then let's see all of you at um, eleven fifteen, and yeah. I'll just quickly continue to um, answer some of the questions from the live chat. Um, Barsani. Asana is asking about the Landesgartenschau Pavilion. How did you handle the polarity of panels in the regions where the Gaussian curvature of the surface changes from positive to negative? Um, it's a very complex geometric problem. Uh, it's not really straightforward. There is like a couple of different um, um, approaches to that. Um, and I'm not directly the expert to answer those. Um, I just know that it's very complex. Um, but yes, there were seamless planar elements. 
and there were no gaps in between. Um, how we can can we estimate the force in the edge of each module for designing the joints? How can ensure that our joints are well set and firm? Um, so <clears throat> this is mostly a structural engineering questions question, which maybe again you could try to ask uh, Simon Bechert on Thursday. Um, I think from a robotics point of view, this is really important. Um, really hit the quality of production. I would be interested to know how the paneling strategy based on agent simulation was done. Is it a custom-made code or there are GH plugins which can be used for doing that? So this is a custom code. Um, as far as I know, we are currently discussing <coughs> to make that um, also open source or to kind of publish the plugin um, for Rhino. But yes, it's a it's the cust it's a custom made code and it employs the principles of agents, agent based design. Um, but those the behaviors of the agents are obviously very um, customized towards the um, towards the specific use case in that structure. Um, the behavior of this material in the rainfall, um, yes, so the wood is going to swell, right? So you really can't expose it to any rain. If you do that, then you have a big problem in any timber construction. As you use panelization, each planar panel, if extruded in its normal vector, the gap or intersection between panels may occur. How did you solve this error? Um, this is solved by having the edges basically be conical. Right? So that Can share again the presentation. So there is no gap between the top the top plates and the bottom plates, right? But you are correct. If you would just extrude it on the normal axis, then there would be a gap, right? So but you just can't extrude it like that. Right? You need to build both the polygon on top and on bottom. So in the end, you have kind of like a conical shape of your edges. Okay, so let's make a quick break and um, we'll be back shortly at 11.30.